Hey, I'm Melanie Johnson, along with my co-host, Jen Foster. We are both 13-time best-selling authors. We've published over 2,500 books and made all of our authors number one bestsellers. We own Elite Online Publishing. If you want to become a best-selling author, look us up at EliteOnlinePublishing.com. Now, welcome to the podcast that shares secrets from top industry experts that show you how to get lasting success and results. This is the Elite Expert Insider Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome. It's Melanie Johnson for another great podcast here today, along with Jen Foster. Hey, Jen. How's everyone doing today? All right. It's a fantastic, fantastic day. You know, the culture of America has changed. The culture of the American workplace has changed. You feel like you got to walk on eggshells with every single thing you say, do, write. It's a scary place out there. So we have an expert in here today to teach you how to navigate that scary territory. Peter Yawitz is here today. He has been in the business for 30 years. All right, I, I just got to say, I gotten to know Peter a little bit before the podcast. And usually you meet someone who, like if you're a financial guy, a county guy, you kind of got that nerdy thing going on. But he has like, oh my gosh, he's written songs. Hello. So he's like this artistic guy, nerdy guy, cultural guy. He is so multifaceted. He fascinates me. I know we're going to learn a lot today. He is the author of Flip Flops and Microwave Fish, um, Navigating the Culture in Today's Workplace. I, I'm just so glad that I, um, you know, we work in a small environment. We're very close knit here. But I, I just have stories of my dad and things have just changed. It's, it's a scary place out there. Peter, welcome. And thanks for coming to help us navigate through this scary cultural uh, company world out there now today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, Peter, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this. And you've been doing it for 30 years. That's awesome. Well, 30 years, yeah. I, there are many chapters to my life as... As Melanie said, I, it's, uh, I, I don't, never look at any, my career as just going like this. It's gone like, like this and this and this. And I don't mean like big troughs, but really changes. I've, I've moved along and adapted. Maybe I don't know whether it's because I got bored or because things happened to me. And I've always managed to enjoy what I do. And But for 30 years, the past 30 years, I have worked for corporations as a management communication consultant, health individuals and groups communicate more effectively to their different constituencies. So when I'm brought into a company, it's usually to help them figure out what their messages are, help them tell stories more effectively that would resonate with whatever audiences need to hear from them. So it could be a pitch, it could be just an informational bit of information. But what I find my value is when I work with them is to take it away from the obvious. I don't want it, we all have listened to boring speeches in our lives. How can we really tap into what an audience is looking for and how can you make put something together or create messages that the audience will say, oh, I remember these people, not because they were my two o'clock appointment, but because there's something about what they said or how they operate that make me feel, boy, I really trust them and I, there's something that's tapped into me somehow. So that's what I've done for many years and, and I, I've enjoyed every minute of it, uh, working with people and traveling around the world and helping people solve those problems. So, you know, storytelling is so big, especially in our business where book publishers and being authentic and telling your story and telling it the right way is so important. Mm -hmm. How do you get to um, that point of walking someone through a company of finding that authentic story and being careful not to offend anybody in the meantime? Well, sure. Let, let me take that offending people out of, of the way, because I think certainly senior people are, are aware that they don't want to offend people. But what I try to get people to do is... I, I love the word that you said, being authentic. I, I said, I really want to get to know you. So if you're speaking too much corporate speak and you're re almost like reading off a teleprompter, I'm not really going to know you or, or know what motivates you. And I can give an example of a CEO that I work with pretty much every year on his annual speech to employees. And every year he says, Peter, here's my draft. And I just... I say, well, that sounds like the same draft you had last year, which was, we have a great company, we have the best, I'm so excited, look around, what a great bunch of people we are. And people will smile and do that, and then 10 minutes later, they might have forgotten exactly what he said, because there was nothing specific about it. So for years, I've been trying to get him to be more open about himself, more personal. And when I say personal, I don't mean, like, tell us about, uh, you know, your, your fight you have with your wife. 
unless there's a good fight in there that, you, that we can learn something from. Because I don't want to, I don't want people to feel uncomfortable giving information away that, that they shouldn't give away. But if I understand what motivates you based on something in your background, or tell me why you joined the firm, or what what got you excited about some new get that you have with a, with a firm or new business opportunity that you have and tell me what that business opportunity was and where it came from, what you did to get there and how it motivated you and how you felt about it. That can help other people understand, oh, I can see why this is motivating him and I can see why I'm part of this and it should motivate me as well. So this year, I like it was the best speech he ever gave because I, I really let him talk to me. I interviewed him a lot to say, what it, was it this year that made you feel so good? Which groups were doing things that they had never done before? And how did you feel about that? And how do you want to motivate other people by that? So it was, there was passion in, in how he was telling about that. He, I heard the excitement. And at the end, when he told me it was over, he said, it was the best thing I ever got. People came up to me afterwards and they said, well, I have an idea for what I could do next year. And that's just much better than, hey, we have a great group. Hey, look at you, Jen. I just think you're the best. Because adjectives only take you so far. Right. I love that. I love that. So, to, so this communication is really what we're talking about is communication. And I have teenagers and they're, I, have, I have one in college. I have them graduating. So tell us a little bit about someone else's dad. Because well, first I, I'll say that every, if you have teenagers, everything I'm telling you doesn't work with your own yeah, kids. Yeah, I know. <laughs> For, forget everything I said right. doesn't work with your own kids. Uh, have right. me come in there and, and, as, an, as a not a, a disinterested party, I can come in and whip them into shape. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, it doesn't yeah. matter if I have good communication skills because they don't listen to me. They don't, yeah, well, their ears that, are turned off. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's why I say forget, forget what I say for your own, yeah. for your own kids. Yeah. A couple of things, you know, it's interesting because, you know, my kids are older, but my son uh, said to me a couple of years ago, you know, dad, one piece of advice you gave me that I still, I still listen, I still hear you saying, and I nearly fell on the floor. It's like, what? First of all, I don't remember what it was that I said. And second, that you actually remembered. And third, that you're following through on it. I, I was uh, completely surprised. But if, if, interesting for what it was, what he did say was, and I think it was when he was at a job where he said, you know, I, I feel I'm just going through the motions. I don't really care. I'm going to move on. And I think I said in my dad voice, you know, they're paying you a salary. So whether you feel you're, you've checked out or not, that's just not yeah. fair to the people who are giving you a paycheck. And it changed his attitude. And I'm glad it changed his attitude. So they didn't fire him. And it's up to him if he wants to move on. But listen, if I'm paying you to do a job, don't just check out because you're going to leave. Anyway, so back to your teenagers where, when they're starting their job. I'm finding that what I say to career advisors who are saying has the same message that they want to impart to their clients or kids who are graduating from college, I say the thing that I want you to think about more than anything else when you start a job is enhance your listening skills. And why is that so important? Because if you don't, if you do this thing that we always do to show that you're listening, like, right. you're shaking you know, like, head in case yeah, you're shaking your head. I mean, just go, uh -huh, oh my God. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, we know how to fake it. And I think kids today are so distracted by social media and their phones and everything else going on that it's harder for them to, I mean, you've got teenagers, it's harder for them to pay attention and really listen. So understanding the importance of active listening to say to someone that you've met, oh, thank you for telling me that, it sounds like this. Or in other words, what you're telling me is this. And I emphasize that so much because in the very beginning, you're going to be meeting a lot of people. You're going to be overwhelmed with information about what to do, what not to do. But it's fine, certainly fine to take notes, but it's really nice to be able to reflect back what you've heard from somebody else mm -hmm. so you can develop a relationship that way and start from the very beginning to say, in, communication is important to me. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. So that is the, the number one thing. And people don't understand it. I didn't understand that when I was in business school, when people said, this is the number one skill you're going to get out of business school, I nearly laughed because I was paying all this tuition. I said, I know how to listen. And, uh, you know, I'm writing a check to, to tuition to learn how to listen. But uh, as you get older, it's, it's just so incredibly important to be able to demonstrate that you've been listening. Well, that's very true, not just in business, but even personal relationships. So listen to your spouse, listen to your child, listen to the relationship with a friend, um, you know, listen to your clients, listen to your employees. Mm -hmm. um, so it goes down to 
all aspects. So you might say, oh, well, I don't have a business or I'm not working. Well, do you have a relationship with anybody that you yeah, care about? That's right. <laughs> Yeah. You know, that listening skill goes the same way going back. And I love what you're saying. I'm going to circle back to being the telling the story. Mm -hmm. How do you get somebody who is fearful of being authentic or, and vulnerable? That's really the key of mm -hmm. telling their story. So you, like you worked with the CEO, you asked mm -hmm. him questions and sometimes you can't get to that crux. So we do that with our authors as well. They have the information but that's what scares them even to go to publish the book. We get them where they're almost there. The story's pretty much written. The book can be 75% done. And then they make an excuse not to publish or finish because they really have the fear of being vulnerable. Will they like me? Will my book be really well mm -hmm. received? Mm -hmm. So when you go into a company and work with someone and consult with them, how do you get them to that next phase? Sometimes it takes a long time. And I spend a lot of time... Uh, interviewing people that I'm working with to really try to find out what it is that their goal is when they're communicating with a specific audience. And so, you know, I really, I, I really try to be very goal oriented with a message or what someone's trying to do. So I would say if let's, let's just go to the extreme, let's just go to the extreme. If you got really what you wanted and even if it's like, I want a million dollars by you know, two weeks, if they think that is achievable and that's what they want, I want them to Hey, this is what I want. And it's just between the two of us. Right. But I really want them to be able to say, this is what I want. And then, okay, so if you got that million dollars, you do a victory lap around the hall. And I actually use that term all the time. What would make you do a victory lap? So the next question is, all right, who is your audience? And how are you going to reach them? What's going to resonate with them? What is it that you're providing? What is it that they need to hear about you? And I just keep questioning them about what, you know, what do we know about the match between you and these people? And sometimes when I hear it, when I hear when they get a little bit vulnerable or when I hear when there is an example of why what they're providing is so important, I will stop and I say, that's it. That's it. What you said there resonates more with me than anything else you said because it is authentic and it lets me understand you a little bit better and it understands truly how you can help me, the audience, with whatever issues that I'm dealing with. And so a lot of it just takes time to get to that place. And my style is, you know, when someone hires me, I will initially book a long session because I want that person to trust me. And, and the first hour could be, just tell me about your life. I'm not, I just want to know about you. What motivates you? Who are you? What, uh, where did you went to go to school? What are your hobbies? What motivates you? And, and you can see as people become more comfortable their body language changes, the way they talk about things. You'll see the smile and the passion on their face. And I'll say, that passion that you're showing me now has to show up in however you present to somebody. Because then I, I'm much more engaged in what you're going to say or what you're going to sell me, and I put that in quotes, right. uh, for me to want to pay attention. Right. Do you ever sing when you're doing those consultations? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it depends. I know I should say I haven't, but, but for a fee, I'll be happy to go. Sing. There you go. That's yeah. good. <laughs> That's great. She only says that because she knows I sing. I mean, she wasn't just yeah. trying to say, would you do absolutely anything for your fee? No, no. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not going well, to try think, to do a handstand because I can't do it. Right. Well, I think yeah. that's really important what you're saying, like getting to know, I, I mean, with any yeah. relationship, you have to build that foundation first yes. before mm -hmm. you can move on to, yep. to training or listening or anything like that. Absolutely. So, yeah. 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 And actually I'll say when I, when I, one of my favorite types of seminars is do a storytelling seminar. And it's great when I ask people to come prepared in advance to uh, prepare a pitch, like a business pitch that can help your organization. And I only want two minutes, just two minutes. And I'll go around the table and everybody will talk about something. And then, then purposefully, I'll take a break and I'll either give them a break or I will uh, talk about something. And then I'll go back and I'll say, let's go around the table. And what was it that Jen wanted to do? And people kind of look, you know, they avert eye contact because they've forgotten and they don't want to <laughs> show that they weren't paying attention. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that maybe they weren't, they weren't focusing on a number. They weren't for, yeah. focusing on a problem that people had that, that that person was going to resolve and why you were the right person to do it and what the implications would be. So then I talk about what makes a story and why people are interested in a story. And a story is yeah. basically, there's a status quo, there's an inciting event that disrupts the static, that status quo, yeah. and we have to find a new way to get to a new status quo. 
And the disruption could be many different things. It doesn't have to be the, mm -hmm. you know, the cyclone and the Wizard of Oz. Everyone always comes up with the Wizard of Oz as an example <laughs> when they're thinking about a story. And, uh, but how can you do that? And when we do it again, and I really try to, I say, who is the audience and how are they going to be affected? Make it as personal as you yeah. think you need to do. And then we do the exercise again. And guaranteed, every, when I go around the table again, everyone can articulate very clearly what the other person has said. Great. All right. So let's talk about the sneaky coworker. Oh yeah, employee, and how to get a raise. So all of us, no matter how smooth your business goes, it may be a client, it may be someone's client who has someone that you have to deal with, maybe someone in house that they have that, uh, you know, that jab, kind of that you feel right. like you're being stabbed in the back every yep. time you're talking to them. That's how do right. you deal with that? Uh, well, first thing I have to say about. Uh, any kind of difficult person is that remember you can never change somebody's behavior you can really only change your response to that behavior so that sneaky coworker, you're not going to give him a magic pill and he's all of a sudden not going to be sneaky anymore the issue is how you're going to handle that sneaky coworker. do you say something do you you don't want to and then again if your personality is not someone who feels i'm going to play sneaky right back which i don't recommend uh you're in a position where all right this person is sneaky i have to watch what i do so there are a couple of things First is that if you know this person is going to be sneaky about things, you can CYA, cover yourself, anytime you're including this person in an email and maybe you want to include your managers in a, in a, in some, in a email chain. So you know what you are doing and maybe you emphasize, I spoke with the client today and the client told me da 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 and CC the appropriate people. So the, the other person is not going to say, well, that was my idea because it was right. clear, I, here were the facts. Here are the facts that, that show that I was the one who yeah. had this idea. And the other thing is, if, if you feel comfortable doing it and you realize that this is something that is interfering with your ability to work effectively, I would call the person out, but, but use facts. Don't, use, don't say things like, you're a sneaky coworker and I hate you, or stop <laughs> being so sneaky, uh, you're really annoying. Uh, because if someone says that you're really annoying, Melanie, you're gonna say, no, I'm not. Or like, exactly. what are you talking about? Right. And it puts you but off the defense. Puts you off. It puts you on the defense. Yeah. And then you say, yes, you are. No, I'm not. And then we're back in second grade. And who wants to go yeah. back? So, but if you have a, a file of actual facts, of, of situations, stories, perhaps, where mm -hmm. Mr. Sneaky or Ms. Sneaky did something for you, you can say, the other, I want to talk to you a second. The other day, when you came by and you took credit for the work that I had done in front of our manager, I felt hurt. Okay, so you're doing two things. One, you're identifying a very specific event that person cannot deny happened. And the second, you're saying how you felt and no one can deny how you felt. You can't say you did not feel hurt. Yes, I did. You know, I was very hurt because I felt that you were taking credit for something that I did. And I would hope that you would not do that again because that affects my credibility as well as yours. Yeah. So have a, have a in the future, I would prefer you're not doing that or please don't make up facts uh, when they're mm -hmm. just not going to help either one of us. So it's almost like a three part message. The first thing is talk about what it is that the person has mm -hmm. done and be very specific. Second is talk about your feelings. And the third is let's let's talk about a resolution because this is not yeah. acceptable. That makes I love it. Well, there's yeah. so much great information. We could just keep talking and talking. I think we're out of time though. So, oh, no. um, let, why I'm don't enjoying you it too much. I know it's so much fun. Um, Melanie was going to ask one other question, which I don't know if you want to answer really quick. What was about the getting a raise? Yeah. So raise. Yeah. This question comes up a lot. Uh, pretty much in every speaking engagement that I have, someone ask about getting a raise, especially if their boss is not there, that they will come up. Uh, and actually, I had a conversation with someone the other day who said, and I, and I think this is a good way of approaching it, someone did ask for a raise, and I felt, well, this person doesn't, she doesn't, there's a woman talking about another woman, this woman doesn't deserve a raise, I just gave her a raise six months ago. And my advice was, and this is something that I would make everyone think about beforehand, is I said to this woman, if she asks you for a raise, just say, okay, I hear you, but why do you deserve a raise now? I want you to go back and I want you to come up with some stories and examples of what you have done over the past six months since your last raise, whenever that was, to say how you enhance the value of our team, or our company, or our workflow, whatever it is, to really try to quantify in whatever way you can why you feel you deserve it. And as part of that too, think about if I did give you a raise, what are you going to do for the next pay period for the, until you get the next raise? So 
if it's based on facts and based on stories, maybe that I don't even know. I don't know that you talked to Estelle the other day and you were able to put a plan in place to help us. Okay, that's very helpful to me to know that you, des you might deserve something if that really added to our bottom line or added to our efficiency. So again, if you were asking for a raise, you should go with your ammunition about why rather than just, I feel I deserve a raise because I've been working here a long time. That's something, you know, also, if you have been working here for a long time and haven't gotten a raise, I think you should speak up. The last thing I want to say about, about all this is that m what I encourage people to do is always to be assertive about what they want. Always be assertive. Think about what it is that you want and be relatively direct about it. Don't beat around the bush. But to f so you don't worry that you're being aggressive, which is a word I hate, be polite about what you're doing. So be assertive and be polite. That's great. Well, where can people go to find more information about you, your website, or where they can go to get the book? Well, thank you very much for asking. Uh, if you go to peteryawitz.com, uh, you will find everything. It's like a clearinghouse for everything except my baby pictures are there, I, I think, <laughs> unless someone has access to it. You can find my uh, the, the website, my consulting website, Clear Communication. You can find my advice from someone else's dad, which is at someone else's dad.com. You can find how to contact me. And also, if you're interested in my book, you can find it through there, or you can go right to Amazon and look for Flip Flops and Microwave Fish, or certainly just search for me on Amazon. Or Barnes & Noble, I know that every Barnes & Noble has one, or I'm hoping your independent bookstore will too, once I get around there. <laughs> That's great. Well, we can't hear Melanie, I don't know why. Thanks so much for, oh, there for we being are. on. That's awesome. We got a lot of great content today. I was taking notes as we were doing it. So everyone, make sure you subscribe to our podcast because we always have fantastic guests on. Um, they give you terrific information that make your life better, make your world better, your family's world better, and your business better. So we'll see you next time. Again, subscribe, leave us a note. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, if you have someone that you'd like to be on our show, give us a suggestion. We always like to hear from you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Are you looking to increase your revenue, build credibility, and elevate your brand? This podcast is brought to you by Elite Online Publishing, an innovative publishing and full spectrum marketing company. They will publish and market your book to make it a number one bestseller. Becoming an author is the best way to market your business. So contact them at EliteOnlinePublishing.com today. All of their authors become number one bestsellers.